I want to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I think um, a lot of us, depending upon what church you went to, uh, would, you would probably give a different answer. Maybe how you were raised, you might give a different answer. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And I want to just see if what you're thinking what it means to be a follower of Jesus is the same thing the Bible says what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because we live in a, we live in a culture today, and um, you know I don't know if you are for or pro or against social media. I have my thoughts on it. There's some parts about it I like, some parts I don't like about it, but uh, uh, I use it mainly to stay in contact with people and our and the staff really wants me to post inspirational quotes out there for you and and um and so but I like it but sometimes I'll be following through people on there and 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 there's some of you I hope probably none of you here that like you put so much information out there it's TMI like this is what I ate for breakfast this is what my doctor said about me this is what I had for lunch and and uh, you know after a while like like I, I love uh, Facebook they had this little button called unfollow and you can just unfollow like that. And uh, you just, you don't, you almost feel so powerful because you can follow or unfollow. They don't even know it sometimes. And, um, and, and so in, in this culture that we live in, you know, uh, following is really becoming sort of a, a modern day term that we have turned into something of convenience because we do the same thing when it comes to following people. If we like them, we stick with them. If we don't, we get rid of them. But what does the Bible say about being a follower of Jesus? Of course, Billy Graham, we sang that song, that hymn, part of it. Billy Graham made that hymn, that it, the anthem of his crusade. When he would give an altar call, thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people a year would come forward to the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. And that was their anthem. And uh, people would respond to that and make it a decision for Jesus. And I want to talk about what it means to make that decision to follow, follow Jesus. Of course, that hymn, if you know the history of that hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. Actually, it came as a true story. In the 18th century, uh, there was a missionary over in, um, excuse me, the 19th century, 1800s, there was a missionary over in a Hindu village. And uh, this Hindu couple got born again. They were the first couple that made a decision to follow Christ in that village. And as they were making that decision, the, the, the chief of the village brought them out in the middle and said, to follow Jesus, there's a penalty for that. You, we're going to execute your family. And so this, this English missionary was over there recording all this. And, uh, and, and, and the chief said, either you renounce Jesus or we're going to execute your family. To which he decided, he, he responded, I have decided to follow Jesus. At that point, the chief took a knife and executed his wife right in front of him. To which he responded, uh, the, the, uh, the cross before me. And, and to which he said, okay, the, the chief came to him and said, okay, and executed him. To which his response was, the world behind me. And that's really, that's the history of that song. I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's where those lyrics came from. And that takes, for me at least, that takes following to a whole other level. That's more than a fish on the back of your car. That's more than, you know, just attending a church. That's a decision where I have made a decision to go all out. And so I want to break this down for you, and I want you to understand the cost of following Jesus. Like, what commitment does he, does he require of you, and what does it mean? And I want to pick up from some verses that I read on Easter, and I want to pick up this story about Jesus and Jesus and his disciples in Mark chapter 8 and verse 27, it says that Jesus and his disciples were, uh, went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And that's really interesting for us to kind of p pick that out, that part there. Because Caesarea Philippi, at the time, it was sort of the, 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 the pagan center of worship. And that's where people from all different cultures and religions would gather together to worship. And so I think Jesus chose this place where the world had a lot to offer you to have this conversation and on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? To which he responded, they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah. 
and still others one of the prophets. And so like that had to be completely discouraging for Jesus having been with them because John the Baptist was just beheaded for them to say, maybe you're John the Baptist or maybe you're a prophet. And that had to discourage him. And then in verse 29 it says, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah. In verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. What's interesting here, when they said Messiah, what they were thinking was is that he was going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire, and they were kind of thinking they were, he was going to raise up this new Jewish Empire, and they were really militarily going to take over Rome, and Jesus was going to be their leader, and maybe Peter, James, and John, the disciples, maybe they thought they were going to be in the cabinet. I don't know. But he said, hey, listen, don't talk about that. Then he began, verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So he's talking about being suffering, rejected, and killed, and this, this really confused them. And I like verse 32. It said he spoke plainly about this, and Peter, only Peter would do this. Like you got to have some guts. Peter took Jesus aside and notice it said he began, he didn't finish, but he began to rebuke him. I mean, come on, you gotta be, you gotta have a lot of guts to take Jesus, pull him aside and say, Jesus, I'm gonna rebuke you. But I like what Jesus, Jesus in verse 33, but when Jesus turned, and now he looked at the whole crowd, the disciples, now he rebuked Peter. Like, come on, you, I, I don't know, that'd be like a fly trying to correct an elephant. You know, and then T Jesus turns around, and he straightens out Peter, and he, he's, co Jesus says, says it like it is. He says, get behind me, Satan. Come on, that's, that's Jesus talking to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, and he said something, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. In other words, Peter, you don't get it. Peter, you're so consumed with your life you're so consumed with you and your stuff and your things and position and power and all the things that a lot of us get consumed with. He said, you're not understanding this. And then in verse 34, he said this. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, here it is. He's going to define what it means to be a disciple. You're not going to, I'm going to shoot plain with you this morning because I'm going to rush through this message because we have some people to baptize today. And Jesus said it clearly what it means to be a follower. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Three things that Jesus said you had to do. Number one, it's simple. He says, you're going to have to be my disciple. You're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, we Today in our, in, our, in our modern day, you know, churches, and the cross is a sign of reverence. It's something to be revered. It's a holy symbol, and people wear crosses on them. But back in the day when, when, this was, when Jesus said this, the sign of the cross was the sign of execution. It was sort of a, a grisly thing to think about. And so it, the best way I could describe it, the modern day, it would be like wearing an electric chair around your neck. You know, a symbol of that. That's what it meant to them. And so he said, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And then in verse 35, he said, for whoever who wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever who loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He basically saying, hey, guys, you're going to die anyway. All of us, how many know all of us one day are going to leave planet Earth? I get you're gonna you're gonna die anyways, but but if you wanna save your life, then you gotta lose your life, and you're gonna lose. And, and some of us are gonna lose it sooner than others. You know, those who eat organic, you might ex add an extra year or two to your life. Uh, you know, you might die with a bad taste in your mouth. I might go out a year earlier, but I'll die happy. You know, uh, but but he said he said you're gonna lose it anyways. And then in verse thirty six, he says, "What good is it for someone to gain?" the whole world, yet forfeit their soul. And I think, um, like, uh, we see this at funerals. I think, I think all of us, like, we're like, wow. Like, like, life really is short. And, you know, but sometimes we pursue the wrong things. 
verse 37, he said, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? In verse 38, he begins to start defining what's important to him. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So here's the question. Why? Why are we talking about this? Because I think all of us are in different walks in our life. And, um, you know, here at East Coast Believers, we see a lot of people get saved every week. A lot of people, like, again, last week, 197 people begin to walk with Christ. And all of us are in different phases of our spiritual walk. And the Bible encourages us to take following seriously. See, because I, and I have to teach this because following in the modern day sense doesn't even make sense. Like for a lot of people to follow means, it means I have to forsake something to follow him. And I have to remind you what the Bible says about this. And so if you want to get all, everything out of life, then you have to give up your life. And so I want to, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is having the same conversation. Luke brings a little different perspective. And in verse 23 he says, Whoever who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And so Jesus takes this discipleship and he kind of breaks it down a little bit further. And in Luke 9 he says it's a, it's a daily discipline. It's a daily decision. And so I, I kind of want to take that verse 23 there and break it down. And I want to locate where you are and take you one step further to being a, a more devoted, committed follower of Jesus because all of us are on a spiritual journey and all of us can take just one step further. I often give the challenge out to people. If you'll commit to serving God a wholeheartedly for one year, like go all out, like be part of a church, go through grow, be in a small group, commit to a Bible reading plan, you know, serve on a team, that after one year, you won't even recognize your life, you will be completely radically different. And all the years I've been given that challenge, I've never ever had anybody come back to me and say, after one year, I'm disappointed, I wish I, wish I wouldn't have done that. But I've had many, many people come back to me and say, I'm so glad you gave that challenge. It didn't take me one year to figure it out. It was worth the return. And six months, seven months later, my life is completely, radically different. And so Jesus is making this statement. If you will lose your life, you will find your life. And I think that's the question a lot of us have to ask. Are we willing to lose our life to find our life. I think you could almost say it like this. Jesus is encouraging us, will you go to the next level? Will you commit yourself to live to the next level? And I love, um, Rick Warren did a teaching on this. And those that know The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, the book, one of the most, uh, one of the most amazing books out there. He really kind of broke this down and, and put a system to it, what it looks like to be a, uh, a follower of Jesus. He broke it down to five levels. Number one, he said this. He said, you can be in the crowd, and I love this, the crowd, and that is to you where you come and see. And that's like, like, that's what we did last week here at East Coast Believers for Easter. Like, just, just come and see. Come and check it out. Like, we're going to give you free coffee. We're going to have great music. If you have children, you can bring them into a, a, another classroom. We're going to even change their diaper. We're going to feed them. We're going to love on them. We're going to have animals out there in the lobby. Your kids can pet, photo stations. We just want you to come and see. We don't want anything from you. We don't want you to give. We're not asking you to serve. We just want you to come. Come and check it out. Be part of the crowd. You know, we just want to bless you. In case you're wondering, Jesus used this same sort of format. When he first uh, introduced himself to Peter, if you go back and read the early Gospels, Peter was out fishing all night, and he wasn't catching anything. Jesus had this interaction with him. He said, hey, go back out and toss your net over. And remember the Bible says, Jesus, Peter said, well, I've been fishing all night. There's nothing out. He said, just do it. And so he did it. He threw his nets over. He caught so much fish that his boat began to sink. Then Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. I mean, no, Peter, for a fisherman, said, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Like he just, it was about being blessed. Then there's the second level, and that's the congregation. And that is come and be a part. Like now, I like what you're doing. Like I like this. My life has been impacted. Now the next level is, hey, why don't you take it to another level and be a part of this? Like, uh, you know, I don't want to just 
be a consumer. Now I want to be a part. I want to be part of the family. We offer this through like our grow classes. Um, it's a four-week membership that we have. Meets during second service, and the next one begins the first week of May. And if you say, hey, like I've, I don't want to be part of the crowd anymore. I want to go just to one more level. I want to come and be a part. And then there's the third level is the committed and that's where I don't want to just come and be a part. I want to come and grow. Like, I want to take it to another level. Like, I'm going to commit to maybe doing a Bible reading plan. Like, I'm going to be part of, of a small group. Like, I'm going to be part of the life of this. And I'm going to grow. I'm going to be in a men's group or a freedom group. And, and I'm going to allow my life to grow some. I'm not just going to get a ticket out of hell and a ticket into heaven. I'm not just going to be part of a church. Now I want to grow in my relationship with him and then the, the fourth level Rick Warren said is the core that is where you're going to come and serve it's no longer just about me anymore and my growth now I want to use my life to make a difference how can I make a difference in the life of someone else that's where I for us that means be part of the go team and that means I'm going to serve in the local church I'm going to be part of a team I want to use my life to make a difference. And I'm telling you right now, those that are part of the GO team will tell you, we, we like to say it like this, we want people to worship one service and serve one service. And the people that do that, I know it's like a three hour commitment on a Sunday, but I'm gonna go to church one service and serve the other. Do you know what people will tell me? My favorite service is always the one that I serve in. Not the one that I attend, but it's the one I serve in. And they serve, and they say, because why? They're, they're finally doing something that's making a difference in other people's life. And by the way, those first four levels, the crowd, the congregation, the committed, the core, that's really our vision. We're going to come and see, get people born again on the weekend, and, and then congregation, come and be a part, go through the grow classes, be part of the family, committed, I'm going to go through a small group. And then number four, I'm going to use all of my skills and my talents to build God's kingdom. But then Rick Warren said something that I think is really the ultimate level. And I think this is what Jesus was talking about in Mark 8 and Luke here. And that is commissioned. That is, I'm going to come and I'm going to give my life to the plan of God. I'm going to come and I'm going to die. No longer is my life about me. The rest of my life belongs to God. I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about becoming a priest or becoming a pastor or becoming a missionary. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm just saying is what he said in this part is no longer is my life just about, my, my faith just about Sundays. Now my life is living for him. Now my life is serving him. I don't live for myself anymore. I live for him. I'm not going to just be a, a priest at church. I'm going to be a priest in my home. I'm going to be a priest. Like, I, I, I'm going to go to the football games, and I'm going to, I'm going to do, you know, all the things that everyone else does, go to football, tailgate. But in that, I'm somewhere going to be aware that I don't live for myself anymore. I live for him. I can have businesses, and I can, and I can you know, travel, but I'm just going to recognize and realize that I no longer just live for me, but I live for him. Why am I going this way, and why am I saying all of this? Because my life now if I'm commissioned, my life is about honoring Jesus. Why am I saying this? Because you're a spiritual being. And you're a three-part being. Your spirit, that's the part of you that's going to live forever. Your soul, that's your mind, your will, your emotions. That's the part, your, your memory, that's the part that you get feelings from. Your body, that's the part that eats, and that's the part that you know breathes, and that's the part that allows you to live on planet Earth. And because, you're spiritual, because you are a spiritual person, I want you to know this. That your spiritual decisions will give you the greatest returns of your life. It absolutely will. Always spiritual decisions will give you the greatest returns. And so what am I trying to do for you? I want to give you an invitation today. From here it is. Some of you are at different levels. And here's the invitation I want to give you. Number one, I want you to go from no commitment to total commitment. Some of you are there. I want you to consider going from a consumer to a contributor. Some of us are there. Like that's okay, we're glad you're consuming, we want you to. I wanna go give you a decision to go from savior 
to Lord. Savior, he saved me. To Lord, I serve him. I want you to go from what he does for me to now what I do for him. And why am I preaching on this? You say, oh, pastor, come on, especially first service. You know, why would I be preaching on this? Because there are a bunch of people every year in our church that begin a new walk with him. Like, I don't know. I want to, don't put this slide up yet until I call for it. But in 2018, I want you to just kind of fathom this in your mind, what you're a part of here. I think we get so accustomed to God's hand of blessing on this church that we forget, like, how amazing our God is and what he's doing here. But I just got these numbers Friday, and, um, and so I, I, I called and I said, I want to get these hard numbers from you, and if I want to find out exactly how many people, don't put it up yet, how many people have made a decision for Christ in our church in 2018. That would be January, February, and March in the first week of April. And so the first three months... Now, I want to put this number up in a minute. And when I do, I want you to give God the biggest praise that you ever could give him. Because this is something really special. Are you ready for this? In 2018, put it up. We've had 486 decisions for Christ in our church. That's amazing. 486. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, like a lot of you might be watching online, a lot of you might be here today that are part of that 486. And you have to be careful because that's just a number. But behind those numbers is a story. And every story is a life that's changed. That's a lot of decisions. So I want to I wanna just wrap this up today because we're getting ready to baptize here. And I want to talk about like those first two groups. Of, of, that we talked about at the beginning. The crowd to come and see, which is great, and the congregation come and be a part. Like, what, what, what is your next step? If you're part of that 486 people that made a decision, like, what are your next steps for you? And I want to give you what the Bible says is clearly the absolute next step that you would take after you made a decision. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41... It describes that step for us. It says, those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day. Do you know in the New Testament there was 27 times that people were baptized? And I, what I want you to see is the order here. They were post, it was always post-decision. Nowhere in the Bible do they have pre-decision baptisms. And so a lot of us, we've been baptized, you know, as babies. And, and, I, and I, I think those are really special moments. And I don't want to do anything that would take away from how incredibly impactful and how incredibly special those are. We have baby dedication services here at East Coast, and they're always very impactful, very spiritual. But in the Bible, those are more dedicatory things. Those are things we dedicate Baptism has always been a post-decision. And oftentimes in the Bible, it wasn't set up like we have it set up today with, a, with the tank here and, you know, and water baptism shirts and sign-ups online and instructions being sent to you and all that. It was always, almost, always spontaneous. Like I made a decision to serve Jesus and people would say, well, then what do I do next? And they said, well, we want to be, you need to be water baptized, to which I I would want to know why. Why is water baptism so important? And I just want to share with you why it's so important in three minutes and 57, 56 seconds. And I want to tell you why it's so important. Here's the number one reason. Because it was so important, we're to do it to follow the example set by Christ. It was so important to, to God, to Jesus, that he did it. Now we know water baptism is a baptism of repentance. It's to, like it's for sins. Jesus never, ever, ever once committed a sin. Why did he get water baptized? I think he did it for us to show us and they, as an example. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I, you know, every once in a while, I, I like to have a lot of fun in church. And I like to laugh and I like to sort of preach um, straightforward truths, but I like to do it in such a way that, um, uh, that's why I can describe it is like, like, 
if you have children, if you had children uh, back in the 70s and 80s when you took cough medicine, it was awful. But like when we started having kids in the 90s, they started giving us flavored cough medicine. They'd put bubble gum flavor in it and all this. And so I remember when one of our kids had a cough and they gave us the medicine, they said, do you want a flavor added to it? I said, absolutely. In fact, double that flavor if you would for us. So, you know, and because it just makes the medicine go down a little easier. But every once in a while, you come across a verse in the Bible there's just no way to sugarcoat it. There's no way to get around it. And um, this is one of those verses. And in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4, it says this. Someone may say, I am a Christian. I'm on my way to heaven. I belong to Christ. But if he doesn't do what Christ tells him to, he is a liar. And so like water baptism is really something that the Bible asks us to do. And what all we're doing is saying, I'm going to identify with Christ. I call it the wedding band of Christianity. I don't know, somewhere along the way, probably like 500 years ago, someone came up with an idea to melt gold down, put it in a circle, and put it on your, put it on your finger, and that meant that you're married. That meant that you belong to somebody else. Like you're, you're not available to anybody else. And, and, that's what, and that's really what water baptism is. It's it's like saying, hey, I belong to Jesus. I'm going to serve him. I'm letting the world know. Making a decision, raising a hand is a very private thing. But being water baptized is always a very public thing. The second thing it is this. It means to demonstrate my changed life. It just says, hey, my life is different now. I'm going in the water one way, I'm coming out another way. See, now today, when we water baptize, we put black shirts on, and we have people who give black shorts. All that's for a certain reason why we do all that. You can figure that out. And, um, but back in the Bible days, they would um, get baptized not in clean, filtered, heated hot tubs. Uh, they don't do it like that. They'd get baptized in dirty rivers, and, and they would go in, and they would put like um, a dirty uh, clothes on on the outside and underneath they'd have a white robe on and this is how they would baptize in the Bible and they would go into the river now we kind of dunk and we have you hold your hold with one hand your nose and all that and pull you out real quick but back in the Bible days they wouldn't do it like that they would just immerse themselves under like this and when they did they would pull off that old dirty clothes and it, and it would float down the river with the current and they would come out with a clean white robe on but what a beautiful picture of really what water baptism is. It's, come on, it's not going to save you, but it demonstrates I have a changed life. The third reason is this. It's a public declaration. Like I'm making, like, I, like let me explain to you like this. I wear my wedding ring and I wear it every day. Can you imagine? If every morning when I left the house in the morning, I went to the garage and I had a little spot on my, you know, on my workshop there and, and I put my ring there and because I'm going to go out and live out into the world. And then when I came home, just before I got home, I put my ring back on. How many of you, and Dina said to me, why are you doing that? I'm saying, well, you know, when I'm home, I belong to you. But when I'm out there, you know, it's just up to me. How, how many of you know you would be a funeral for your pastor next week? You just need to know that. Like, that's not going to work. Like, I, I wear this ring all the time. Listen, not for Dina's sake. I wear it for, for your sake because you can't have this. <laughs> I'm taken. Like, I know that's not what you're thinking, but, but, but it makes me feel good. But what, what I'm saying is, is this. It's a public declaration. That's what water baptism is. It's a public declaration. Matthew 10, it says it like this. And everyone who, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will de deny also, deny before my Father in heaven. Like, I, like all I'm saying is, is this. Like going public with your faith. Because like, I know people today, this is what the Lord wants you to believe that my faith is private. And, 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 and like that's the biggest lie ever, that my faith should just be private. Like I shouldn't let anyone know. I'm not talking about going to the other extreme being obnoxious. But no, your faith is never meant to be private. The Bible says that you're to be a, you're to be a light on a hill for everyone to see. 
Like that's what he wanted you to be, like to be exposed, let everyone see what your life is. And all, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, is maybe, like if going public for God is too much for you, and I'm just going to throw it out, maybe following is not your deal. Like maybe that's just not for you. I mean, I know people that say, well, I don't know if I want to get water baptized because, I mean, you know, in a tank, people go before me. This is all filtered, by the way. And, uh, and I don't know if I get in there and, and what if it's dirty and what if, what if, I, I mean, I don't know. You know, when that, when that Hindu family, were, they wrote the song, I Have Decided, I, I, I just can't imagine him asking, hey, before you slip my throat, could you make sure that that knife is clean? You know what I mean? Like, like, like I know I'm talking plain to you, you're not used to this, but, but I have decided to follow Jesus. I guess, like it's, I'm gonna go to the next level with this.